October 9, 1943. England, 8th Air Force Bomber Command. Inside the operations war room, nerve center of the vast organization which was directing daily attacks against target Germany, the commanding general staff stood ready. Like the bombers on nearby fields, they waited for General Fred Anderson's briefing. Time for decision was at hand. Tomorrow's targets were about to be selected. The general relied on a mountain of information from his intelligence and weather experts. What's the weather prospect today, Major? It looks like most of Germany will be pretty good, sir. But we have a warm front approaching from down here, which we do not expect to affect the bases until late in the evening. How's the weather at Anklam? At Anklam, sir, we expect two to five tenths of low cloud and small amounts of middle and high cloud above 18,000 feet. Visibility six to eight miles. How about Marienburg? At Marienburg, two to four tenths of low cloud, a little or no middle or high cloud, visibility six to eight miles. What will it be at Danzig and Gdynia? At Danzig and Gdynia, sir, two to five tenths of low cloud, two to four tenths of high cloud above 23,000 feet. Visibility in there about five miles. Give me the map of Anklam and the picture of the aircraft factory there. Yes, sir. Maximum effort. This field order was flashed to 150,000 men and 600 aircraft. The mighty 8th Air Force was alerted. Because most of the bombers were going deeper than ever before, the plan was for the task forces to spread and thus divert German fighter defenses. Each route, though aimed at a vital target in the enemy's industrial heart, was carefully plotted to minimize enemy flak and fighter interference. General Bob Williams, 1st Division, tackled their part in the mission. Control point here at zero hour. Another control point here for the bottom unit, zero plus 40 minutes. Uh, the other from, from, that, from, that, from that timing, where will that put our northern force at the time that our southern force hits the IP? Uh, the northern force should be about the east coast of Denmark at that time, sir. It looks like we're going to catch all the fighters on the southern port, aren't we? Looks very much that way, sir. Well, I think we'd better bend that uh, route around so it's headed towards Berlin. If we can pin those uh, German fighters down in Berlin until we can get started home, they'll never catch us. Meanwhile, General Hodges' second division got ready. Danzig, eh? That's fine. How many ships do we have tomorrow? Well, sir, if you recall, General, on our last mission, we had heavy battle damage, and now all those aircraft are repaired yet. Call up the wing commanders and have them put pressure on the groups to get their maintenance crews to work on these ships tonight and get every possible airplane on the line in the morning. The planning continued at General Russ Wilson's 3rd Division. Looks pretty good, sir. We're going to be right over a lake there for a good checkpoint to turn. We're going in against the sun. The sun will be at our back, sir. Defenses at the target. Uh, Major Frost, uh, what about the flag defenses? Sir, the upper target, there are 24 guns. That approach is good. The lower target isn't defended by heavy guns. No heavy guns, whatever, at Marienburg. Uh, at combat wing operations, Colonel Kessler's unit plotted airplane takeoffs and assembly. Field order requires that we provide the second combat wing and the second air task force. 89th group will lead, 81st group will be high, and 63rd group will be low. Uh, that means that Colonel Whitten will lead the combat wing on this mission? That'll be fine. Planning was turned into action. Pilots came for the word in the briefing room. For some, it was their first mission. Most of us were veterans. 
Everyone was checked in, no strangers allowed. What went on here could mean life or death in the air later. In a few minutes, we'd learn the nature, locale, and route of today's mission. Who was carrying the ball and what protective tactics we'd use. Once everyone settled down, the briefing started. always had a few words. Men, the going's going to be rough. You're going to have to bow your neck in there and stay in there and pitch every minute. Now, gentlemen, this is the type of targets you don't want to have to go back after the second time. Remember that your biggest enemy is still the single-engine fighter plane. Now, you bombardiers, take your time in going in on your releases. Now, if you get any trouble, up in this area, remember you can always board a swing. Get down, leave the country. And it's close over there. Could be rough. Don't think it'll be too bad. And whether it's easy or rough, I'll be sitting out in front, taking the, the whole works in. It was quite a show. After three hours, we had penetrated deep into Germany. And so far, our tactics had paid off. We were getting through. Our liberators and fortresses followed the timetable of our flight plan in tight formations. As we approached our target, some of the Germans intercepted. But enemy fighters and enemy flak didn't stop us from getting to our objective. Anklum, Gdynia, Danzig, Marienburg. All work in these German war plants came to a sudden and violent stop. Bombing the target, the group leader instantly called the Bomber Command. This command, in turn, promptly informed Ira Aker, the commanding general of the 8th Air Force. Now, Aker, I have the additional information I reported to you that Aker was attacked for all primary direct attacks and received strike messages on all primary. Standing at 1307, Marienburg at 1305, and Katsina at 1311. Yes, sir, I'll advise you as soon as they land. This was a signal for the 8th Fighter Command to put into action their part of the battle plan. At the British bases, more than 150 P-47s began to take off to escort the returning task forces. The Thunderbolts joined up with the bombers north of Holland. Immediately, enemy fighter activity ceased. From now on, it was a milk run. Back at the bases, 145,000 men sweated out the mission. All over the field, at dispersal areas, the control tower, the Red Cross, everyone wondered how many would return. Finally, the Marienburg task force was sighted, more than mighty strong. Only two bombers missing from this group. The other task forces to Gdynia, Danzig, and Anklam had suffered stiffer enemy pounding. Tactics had called for them to attract enemy fighters away from the main target. It was a calculated risk, but compared to Schwankfurt, losses were cut in half.
One by one, the bombers set down. At long last, the flyers had returned home. Happy that they got back, our gunners celebrated their victories. Nearly 150 enemy planes destroyed. Although tension eased for the ground crews, the job of the flyers wasn't done. Before the airmen could rest, they were rushed to interrogation while their impressions and memories were still fresh. Every bit of information was needed for future planning. Three hours and 21 minutes ago, these men were over Anklam. What time did you go over the target? Uh, 11.43 hours. We were in a small thousand feet. Did you get your bombs on the target? Uh, yeah. What about enemy fire officers? Well, that's something we figured out. Uh, really, really. Uh, yeah. Well, let's get some of the details. Where did it begin, Paul? Well, they first jumped at the 10.30 largest off the Danish coast. And how long did the attack continue? They stayed with us to the target and until 13.27. Then at 13.45, we had another group attack and stayed until 14.05. We had a couple more attacks, and the last one was at 15.26, just off the Danish coast coming out. What type of enemy aircraft did you encounter? Oh. Well, from what I could see from the tail, they threw the book out. That's W-190s, ME-109s, 110s, 210s, even JU-87s and 88s. I knocked down two. They were making attacks about 5 o'clock level. Yeah, I saw them. One of them blew up in the air, and the other one went down in flames. Were any other guns firing at these planes? No, sir. These were my babies. Interrogation over, the cold facts were collected. Strike photos were processed. They revealed the primary target, the Marienburg Park Wolf aircraft plant, almost completely destroyed. Only yesterday, it had been turning out half of Germany's FW-190 fighters. In fact, the concentration of bomb bursts was so great that General Hap Arnold called it the finest example of precision bombing on record up to this time. Success was the result of scientific planning by an Air Force which knew its business. For two more years, the lessons of these maximum effort, long distance missions were to be applied on an even greater scale over Germany and then Japan, with the combined bomber and escort fighter strength of the growing United States Air Force. Oh.